Good morning. Please join me for a word of prayer. Abba Father, come, be present, be with us. Father, I know we don't have to ask, you're already here, but but you too ask us to, to reveal our heart to you. And that's my heart today, Father. That especially in this message, we would see you, and we would see our Lord and our King Jesus, and we would understand, Father, that the message is far deeper, far richer, and one that we need to heed. And so, Father, I stand here before you this morning and confess, in just this moment, I feel so inadequate and so unworthy. And so I give this moment, these few moments, to you. Because it's not my message anyway. It's yours. So set me aside speak your truth. Father, we lift up to you those who are not with us, some because of illnesses that have kept them at home, others that have forced them to hospitals and rehab facilities and and even long-term care facilities. Father, we just pray that you would minister to each one as only you can as the great physician. You know each need, and you know the, the right time and the right way to bring the healing that is needed. And so, Father, we rest knowing that you are in control. We pray for those that are struggling, Father, with other burdens. And the list is so large. Pray for those who are struggling emotionally, and especially those that are struggling spiritually. Father, would they know you today? May your spirit speak clearly, and may their spirit be willing to receive, but not just theirs, Father, ours as well. For we too come here because you've called us, but also, Father, we come carrying our own struggles, our own fears, our own burdens. But we come into your presence, Father, to to rest and to grow. And so, Father, just now, remove all the distractions Help us to be in tune and in, in, in intentionally listening for your voice. So, Father, set me aside again that the voice they hear is not mine but yours. As the Spirit intercedes and shares your message with each of us, me, your servant included, so give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there are some messages that we full-time preachers, I guess, wonder how do we make it new and how do we make it fresh? Easter. We preach a message about Easter every year. Christmas. And the one today is, is no different. Oh, we may not preach about it as often. And, and yet, in reality, we talk about it every week. And so I have prayed and I have struggled with this morning's message. And now I just give it to the Lord.
It's his. And hopefully he will guide my words and that the Spirit will interpret for you his message. Or maybe I insert myself and shouldn't. So this morning, we continue on our quest, a quest we've been on since the beginning of the year, a quest that I hope you have taken to heart to spend time to get to know Jesus in a fuller and a deeper and a more rich way. And today we turn to that moment when, when Jesus instituted the meal that sets before you that we, we call the Lord's Supper. We refer to it as communion or, or some faiths call it the Eucharist, the, the holy meal. But I don't want to focus so much on the meal this morning as the teaching around the meal. Because there's a message for us, folks, and it's not just the message of the cross. Don't get me wrong. That is key. I thank the Lord that he went to a cross, that he gave his life, that he bled and he died for me. Because I need it. Because I'm a broken person. And so I don't want to make light of that, but there's more we need to grasp. Because it's in this moment, I believe, that Jesus begins to hand off his mission. And he makes it our mission. And as Mark begins to share these events, he does it by sharing, interestingly enough, about not one meal, but two. One that takes place in the city of Bethany, the home of his friend Lazarus, and and where he spent uh, most evenings that last week as he looked forward to the role that he would play as he carried out his obedience to his father and goes to a cross. So let's look at that first meal for just a moment. It's found recorded there in Mark, the 14th chapter. We're going to to begin reading in verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now it's interesting, we need to understand something about Simon. Simon apparently no longer has leprosy. If if he had, Jesus wouldn't have been in his presence, neither would any of the others, because that would have made them ceremonially unclean. Now, we don't know, but chances are Simon was one that Jesus had healed. But for whatever reason, Jesus is in Simon's house, and it continues on. And he was reclining at table. In other words, he was having a meal. And a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whatever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, I want you to hang on to that word proclaim because that's our mission. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. The second meal, one which we are more intricately aware of, was, has us returning to that upper room that we were in last week. But before we get to that and the culmination of the the meal that the Lord institutes as a memorial meal, 
I want to focus a little bit on this meal. This meal that Jesus is partaking at, at Simon's house. In both of these meals, Jesus is the, the central focus. He's the central character. He's, he's the individual that is being honored. And yet, there's a secondary individual. And we need to be sure we take notice of them. In the meal at the home of Simon the leper, it's an unnamed woman, and yet one which Jesus says the world will know about each time the gospel, the good news, is shared with the world. They will know about her because of what Jesus would suffer on our behalf. The second individual was a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. He's one of the disciples of, of Jesus. However, Jesus tells us, as we will see, Judas is the one who would betray him. A friend. One who had spent three years almost daily in the presence of his Lord, his Savior, learning at his feet, and yet rev never really fully accepting who Jesus is. And we need to take time and reflect upon these two individuals. Because there's a message in this meal that reminds us of them. From Mark's account, we, we don't learn much about this, this woman's background. There, each of the Gospels has an account of Jesus being anointed by a woman. Luke's tells us that she was a, a woman of ill repute. Luke is probably not the same account. There were probably two because Luke also talks about the anointing being of the feet and being dried with the hair. Here in Mark, we have this woman that comes in. And remember, they're in Bethany. John would tell us that it was probably Mary, the, the sister of Lazarus. But we don't know. And I don't think it's important that we know the name. We need to learn from her heart, not her name. We do know that we don't even know if she was an invited guest or she just showed up, but we do know that she came to worship and honor and praise Jesus. We don't know her whole reason for, for the anointing with oil, I seriously doubt that it was her intent to, to anoint him for burial because they were looking for a Messiah that would take the throne of David in a military fashion. Even though Jesus had, had taught three times before that, that this moment that is coming would happen, We don't know if she was present as an invited guest of the meal as, as Martha and Mary were in the house of Lazarus. We just know that she was there. And she approaches Jesus. And the, in, in the midst of this, she pulls out an alabaster flask. This was no cheap vase. This was an expensive piece of pottery. And within it was an expensive, costly ointment or, or perfume. The scripture describes as pure nard. It was very aromatic. And she approaches Jesus and she breaks the head of that flask, makes it unusable anymore, and she then pours the entire content on Jesus' head. And can you picture it? This ointment, this liquid begins to flow down Jesus' face and his beard and soon covers him. And, and the pungent odor fills 
the room. And those there began to complain. Why would you do this? That, that would have cost nearly a year's wages. In other words, folks, don't miss this. She gave all she had, a year's wages, in one little flask of perfume. And she did it to worship and honor Jesus. She gave everything she had in that moment to the one she loved. She held nothing back. She gave everything. Now, I want you to contract that, contrast that with, with Judas. This, this man who knew Jesus well, who had traveled with him, who had spent nights sleeping in the wilderness with him. The one who would ultimately, Jesus would ultimately define at the next meal as, as his betrayer. Now, as, there's a lot of speculation as to why Judas did what he did. Some think he was trying to force Jesus' hand and, and began the military coup that would overthrow Caesar and the Roman government and, and reestablish the, the throne of David. Others think he was just greedy, which isn't wrong. John tells us that. He was stealing from the treasury of the disciples. And we really don't know because Scripture doesn't tell us except for one thing. The one thing that we do know is that he has chosen to follow the wishes of the enemy. That he has chosen self over others. That he has chosen self over service to his king, Jesus. Mark 14, 10 and 11, we find these words. Then Judas Iscariot who was the one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportune time to betray him. John, as we saw last week, as, as we looked at the, the same upper room and the washing of the feet, says, Satan entered the heart of Judas. Judas longed for self. Even, even if he truly wanted Romans overthrown, why? For his own benefit. He didn't care about anybody else. It was all about Judas. Judas chose to serve the enemy and self, unlike the woman who decided to give everything she had to honor Jesus in that moment. So when we come to this meal, we should always come in a manner which reflects the heart of this woman and not the heart of Judas. We should never come to this table thinking only of self. We should come first and foremost, surrendering everything to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Surrendering our lives in full obedience to Him. After all, isn't that what Jesus is about to do? He's about to give everything for us. And why? because his father's asked him to do it. He surrendered to the will of his father and remained obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. And so this meal is not just about remembering, oh, it's certainly that. We find the apostle Paul telling us that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's certainly that, but it's more. 
It's a proclaiming again and again, over and over, every time we come to this table, that we are giving our lives in the service of our King. That we are surrendering ourselves to His Lordship. That we are choosing obedience over self. Secondly, as we see this carried out, the message from this meal is that it was never meant to be shared in isolation, in solitude. You know, oftentimes we talk about this being a time between us and Jesus, and it certainly is that, and it must be that. But Jesus didn't take them one by one and institute this meal. They'd come together in community. They'd come together in family. They'd come together as one to share this meal. It was shared in community to proclaim their oneness, their oneness with Jesus, yes, but their oneness with each other as well. You see, the church, I believe, started possibly in this very moment. I know there's the day of Pentecost and, and the Spirit comes down. But I want you to also remember how Peter, how the, Luke records that. It says, and 3,000 were added that day. How do you add something if it hasn't already existed? The community was already with Jesus. The church was already beginning. And I believe he instituted the oneness of that church through this meal. He called us to unity in him. And we see that, I believe, recorded here as well. In Mark 14, through 24, we find the, the words instituting the, the meal that, that we share on a weekly basis. And as they were eating... He, Jesus, took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take. And in the, in the true Greek, there is no, there's no verb there. It's take, my body. We make it read easier in English. Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And notice what Mark says here. He took a cup. He didn't take 80 cups. He took one cup. And he blessed it. And he gave thanks. And he gave it to them. And they all drank of it, of that one cup. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I want you to picture that moment. It's a precious moment of Jesus sharing himself with us, of uniting us with him. And he he does it symbolically. He picks up a loaf of bread, one loaf, And he holds it and he he asks God's blessing upon it. And maybe it was the the typical Hebrew Seder. Thank you for the grain that you have given us. We don't know. We just know that he he asked thanks. He, he, He blessed it. And then he broke it. And from that one loaf, he gave it to each of those that were present. Whether it was just the 12 or whether it was the full Compliment of disciples that had been following him. Oftentimes we think it was just the 12. It's the picture we've got. But scripture doesn't tell us whether it was 12 or it just says the disciples were with him. And so he passes that around and they take from one loaf because Jesus is one. And he calls us to be one. Remember his high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, that they would be one as you and I are one. And that they would be one with us. 
This, this picture of, of communion is a call to unity in Christ, unity in the body, unity as the living body of Christ, his church in the world today. And then he takes from the cup, he picks up one cup, and probably, in all honesty, if you talk about the Seder today and you listen to them, they, they talk about the four cups. There were probably four pourings. It was probably just one cup. They didn't have four separate cups. They would pour wine into it, and they would go through the original blessing, and then they would pour more wine, and they'd go in it. And so they come to, to this moment, this one cup. And Jesus gives thanks for it. Thank you for the fruit of the vine, Father. Possibly. We don't, again, we don't know. It doesn't tell us the words Jesus spoke. He just spoke words of thanks. And then he gives it to them and he says, drink from it, all of you. And they passed that one cup around and each one drank from it. Again, defining their unity. When we come to this table, folks, we need to come with a heart of worship for Jesus and all that he's done for us on the cross. But we also need to come mindful of one another. We're in this battle together. And it is a battle. It is a war. It's a war that's been won because Jesus won it on the cross. But he's called us to continue his mission. He's called us to be unified. It's also a reminder of our call to that full surrender that I spoke of. To surrender and obedience to his lordship. We must come to this meal with a sense of our calling to give all of us to taking the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified to the world. We need to have that devotion that the Jewish people in that day probably prayed at least twice a day, more likely three. They call it the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Here are the words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You hold nothing back. You give it all to Jesus. Jesus would restate that when, when confronted as to what the greatest commandment was. And in Mark 12, we find these words recorded. Jesus answered the young man. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Shema. And then he pr proceeds. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Think back. They were indignant because that could have been given to the poor. Jesus wasn't saying you don't take care of the poor. But Jesus is telling us to make sure we have our priorities in order. He was only going to be with them for a short period of time longer. They needed to drink those moments in you would have time to take care of the poor. And we as the church have been called to carry out that message, that, that mission. But our mission first is to Him, to surrender to Him in obedience. Each time we gather around this table, we proclaim our love and our worship to Jesus for the work of salvation, which He accomplished on the cross. Because without that, all of this is meaningless. It's just a loaf of bread and a, a cup of juice. Without what Jesus having gone to the cross, none of it matters. But because he did, he's given us a message and a mission to proclaim. And we do that each time we come to this table. We proclaim our unity with him, but we also proclaim 
our unity with the church universal, not just here, but all believers around the world. And we're called to share the message of redemption, of salvation, of hope. A oneness that leads to our being willing to give our all in continuing the mission Jesus has given us. When their wedding venue fell through at the last minute, Krista and Jeremy Barusa decided to hold the ceremony in the fire station where Jeremy served as a firefighter for the people of St. Paul Park, Minnesota. Knowing there was a definite possibility the alarm could go off during that very special ceremony, Krista told Jeremy, if the alarm goes off during the ceremony, you're going to have to let your, your other fire people go and take care of it. You, you can't go. Fortunately for the couple, they, they were able to make it all the way through the ceremony without a hitch. No alarms, no problems. However, as they began to take photos between the, the wedding ceremony and the reception, the fire alarm goes off. And it's an alarm for, for them to go and ha- aid another uh, fire department that's fighting a, a house fire that's just overwhelming them in a nearby town. And the young bride, Krista, looked at Jeremy and she told him, Go ahead. You, you go with your, your, your brothers and you fight the fire and then come back when the fire is under control. So without hesitation, Jeremy took off his, his wedding clothes and he donned his firefighting gear and he stepped on the first truck that was heading out. You see, two years ago, Krista had lost a niece and a nephew in a house fire. And she knew how important it was for Jeremy to to battle the blaze. She would later explain to a reporter, saying, I've got the rest of my life with him. But the families whose house was ablaze needed him for that moment. What a wonderful reminder for us is followers of Jesus. We have all eternity with Jesus. The world needs him now. We have him to give, to share, together. The question is, are we willing? This meal calls us, reminds us that that our, our eternity with Jesus is secure. We have him for all eternity. There's a lost and dying world out there that doesn't. And Jesus says, go. Go share the gospel. Go share the good news. Our mission to the world is to share Jesus with everyone we meet. Jesus didn't hold back himself from from Judas. He went to the cross for Judas just like he did for us. He didn't change. The Apostle Paul, when he speaks of this meal, and in all honesty, was probably the first recording of of the events around this meal, likely written before the Gospels. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have a responsibility to proclaim Jesus, not just in the moment that we share together around this table, but when we leave this place. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this same verse in the message. He says this, what you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact your words 
and actions. The death of the master. You reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. This can't be just any other meal. It can't be just something that we do every Sunday because it's part of a routine, it's part of a ritual. There must be meaning behind it, and there must be an understanding that we are called to take the the heart of this, this meal to a lost and dying world. There's an issue of the National Geographic, and it explored how sharing food together was always been, has always been part of, of the human story, the human experience. The article points to a cave near Tel Aviv where, where there's evidence of an ancient meal that's prepared at a hearth. The oldest ever found where diners gathered to eat together. In the cave, the archaeologists found a circular loaf of bread with, with scoring marks, probably where Jesus, same type of loaf, and Jesus would have tore the bread across the, those scoring marks to share it with his disciples. The article that would then go on to say, to break bread together is a phrase as old as Scripture itself. It captures the power of a meal to forge relationships, bury anger, and provoke laughter and joy. This meal is a time of healing, but it's also a call to service. It's a call to mission, folks. And when you partake of it, you're accepting the mission Jesus has handed us. We, as a family, are accepting it together. And so, you've heard me oftentimes say, don't rush this meal. I think that's what Eugene Peterson meant when he said, you must never let familiarity breed contempt. We can't just go through the motions. We need to meet Jesus, and we need to spend time with Jesus so that we can take him outside the walls of this building. Many fears, I think, many times I fear we've just turned it into that, something we do at the end of our service, when in reality it is the most sacred and most important moment in our service. Me standing up here speaking is not it. Meeting Jesus at his table is. And while this meal is a memorial, we also need to recognize that it was a moment of Jesus teaching and preparing us for the difficulty of service and reminding us that Our call to service is to surrender everything to his lordship. So when we come to the table today, I encourage you, don't rush. Meet Jesus. Listen for his call. Understand the commitment that you make every time you partake of this meal, to take him to the world. And then leave this table knowing that Jesus goes with you because you have taken a part of him. You have received him into your body. Father, As I began, I feel so inadequate in sharing this message. And I still feel that way. But it's your message. And your spirit is here. And so may you take the words that have been shared. And may you interpret them into our spirits and into our lives. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. 
We thank you for his willingness to go to the cross. We thank you for this meal that he has prepared for us. We thank you for the example of the woman who gave it all. We even thank you for the example of Judas who sought self instead of you because they both speak messages that we need to hear and we need to heed. One brings us closer to you. The other pushes us further away. So may we heed your call. May we be the servants you long for us to be, you created us to be, you've called us to be. As we surrender to the lordship of your son, take us and use us as we go out into a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to step into a time now where we share in this very special meal. I pray that something has touched your heart and that you don't rush through this moment. I also want to give you a time to respond. You respond by coming to the table, but there are other ways you can respond. You can spend time in prayer with Jesus. You can commit your life for the first time to him, or you can rededicate your life. I don't know what he's speaking to you, but I know he has spoken. And this time of response is for you that may watch us later online. We encourage you, give us a call here at the church. We'd love to share with you, to pray with you, to encourage you, and to be the servants God's called us to be. So would you respond as we sing?